2 p.m. Okay, looks like we are live, folks. Um, welcome, welcome. If you haven't already, please uh, put your name and um, location in the chat. Uh, love to hear where you're from. It is really exciting to see so many folks from all over the country and around the world. Italy, Myanmar represented, um, Canada, um, all over the continental United States. So it's great to see everyone. Today, um, we will be talking about uh, professional development resources for OER adoption and creation. We've got an excellent panel with us today. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just kind of give you a little bit of overview of who we are at CCC OER, uh, introduce the panel, and they're gonna talk about uh, three different areas of professional development, kind of the, uh, an, a really wonderful resource out of Texas called Texas Learn OER, then we'll talk about copyright and licensing, which is always a popular topic. And then we'll talk about kind of, you know, say you are familiar with OER, what's the next step? How can you learn more? How can you become more engaged in the community? So we'll hear more about self-directed self learning and, and building a community. We'll share some resources with you and uh, have a Q&A period and then um, close with uh, some upcoming events uh, and ways for you to stay in touch. As always, please uh, put your questions in the chat and I'll be monitoring that and we, uh, we will uh, try to redirect those to the Q&A period or answer them in the chat as we can. So our panelists are um, from from around the, the US. Um, we have Ursula Pike, who's the Associate Director of the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas, or Digitex. We have Shanna Hollich, who's the Interim Director of Library Services at Wilson College. And Cheryl Coulier, uh, Open Education Librarian from the University of Arizona. I'm your moderator, Nathan Smith. I'm the uh, faculty and residence OER coordinator at Houston Community College and also a philosophy professor. CCC OER's mission is to expand awareness and access to high quality OER, support faculty choice and development, foster regional OER leadership, and improve student equity and success. The primary way that we do that is by building a community of practice through our member organizations uh, from around the US, uh, Canada, um, and, and uh, connecting each other, connecting with each other through these webinars, through a very active listserv, and through a, a really helpful website with lots of resources for you. So if you have, are you, if you're interested or have uh, questions, please visit the website at cccoer.org and, um, and become a member. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenter, Ursula Pike. Great, thank you so much, Nathan. Welcome everyone, I'm so excited to see you here. So uh, if you could go ahead, yes, perfect. I am going to talk about Texas Learn OER today. So again, I'm Ursula Pike. I'm the Associate Director of the Digital Higher Ed Consortium of Texas. I am also a member of CCC OER's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. So what is Texas Learn OER? It is a 10-module asynchronous self-paced training uh, on OER basics with a Texas twist. And it was launched in August of 2020. It's a Google site and also a Google Doc. And I'll, I'll have a link to that later. And it's CC BY, so it's, it's open for adaptation. Um, if you could go to the next one. Yes, so the origin story of Texas Learn OER is that the great Carrie Gitz, who is a librarian at Austin Community College, as part of her Spark OER leadership program, she developed ACC Learn OER. And Dr. Judith Sebesta, who's the executive director of Digitex, and I really loved this resource. We thought it was great and easily understandable. And so we worked with her to 
adapt it to be broader, to, to address the whole state. And let's see. And so she created Texas Learn OER. If you could go to the next slide. And it, it included many of the, the same things that were in ACC Learn, but then it was broadened to look at the requirements in Texas and some of the issues in Texas. And it took about um, six to nine months. And I want to make it clear that we, um, we compensated Carrie for her work. I think it's really important to remember that these free resources that we're creating actually take a lot of work. And, and it's important to compensate the librarians and the faculty and folks, if we can, for their work. Um, one thing that, ACE, that ACC Learn OER had that we brought over into Texas Learn OER is having it peer reviewed. Could you go to the next slide, Nathan? So we were able to get some fantastic folks from both in Texas and then outside of Texas who could give a, a nationwide perspective. And, and they gave us reviews and they gave us great feedback and we were able to um, incorporate that into the Texas Learn OER modules. And I, I think that's a, this is a critical step in developing any OER. So um, if you could go to the next slide. So as I said, it's 10 modules. And one of the modules, for example, here is module five, finding and evaluating OER. And Here's the information, and I, I think it's also important to recognize that we reused some existing really good resources on OER basics. So, for example, Abby Elder at Iowa State University has a phenomenal course with great videos and information, and we reused some of her training videos, some of her content, and other sources as well. So I want to be sure to point you to Abby's great resource if you're also looking for basics in OER. Um, if you go to the next slide. So as I said, it's OER basics, but with a Texas twist. So that Texas twist is information on the landscape of OER, what schools are using OER in the state of Texas, and really critically, looking at legislation around OER, because Texas has had some specific legislation in the last session and then in the current session, looking at um, how they want OER and open education to show up for students, how to make sure that students can find it in the schedule. And so this was really important to us to make sure that we gave people this information as part of this. And, and this is something that we are continually updating um, and making sure that any current issues that, that come up are, are part of this. Because in the two, in the year since we created this, there have been changes, there have been recent developments. And so we want to make sure this part is, is updated. Uh, the next slide, please. So one of the most important parts of Texas Learn OER is the certificate. We want people to be able to test their knowledge after they complete the 10 modules, um, to test for understanding, and then to get a certificate that they can, maybe they can get some CEUs for that, but it shows that they completed that, they can add that to their CV. It shows that they put some uh, effort into understanding OER. Uh, the next slide, please. So on the copyright and attribution module, we have a link to the Google Doc. And the reason why that's in there is we want to make sure that people are taking this resource and adapting it for their own use. So there's instructions here, but then also specifically in Texas Learn OER, there's instructions for how to take the existing resource and adapt it to your own. Um, and the next slide, please. Because as I said, we want you to take and adapt Texas Learn OER to your local content. 
Rice University has taken it and created OWLS Learn OER. And then other colleges, here's an example of one, Northern Virginia Community College has created their own resource. But we have talked to numerous other states about developing their own. And we are happy to, to talk to you about how we work through that and, and give any advice that we can. But we really think that this is a good resource and it can be made better by addressing institutional or regional issues related to OER. So that's the, that's Texas Learn OER. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, and y'all, if you have questions, please share them in the chat and we'll uh, come back to Ursula in the um, Q&A period. But um, the next uh, speaker will be Shanna. Shanna, go ahead and take a Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I am Shanna Hollick. I'm the Interim Director of Library Services at Wilson College, which is in South Central Pennsylvania in the US. Um, and I'm going to talk today about where you can go to get some details and some training and information about the licensing and copyright parts of OER. Um, so the more you get into OER, a lot of people we find end up having some really specific and detailed questions about, well, how does all this CC licensing stuff work anyway? What are the copyright laws in my jurisdiction? How do I know what I am and am not allowed to do with certain types of content? So on the next slide here, I have what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about because it's kind of the biggie. Many of you may have already heard of these uh, Creative Commons, which is a you know global organization that make licenses. They support the open movement. They do all sorts of things. They also run these certificate courses. Um, and there are links throughout. The slides will be shared along with the recording, so you'll have access to all of this stuff. Um, what the Creative Commons certificate courses do is give you a really in-depth look at the CC licenses. There are six of them sort of seven. Uh, the basics of copyright, the foundation of Creative Commons, uh, and open practices in general. It's a 10-week course. Uh, it is asynchronous, but it's cohort-based. So you register for a specific time frame, and you have weekly deadlines that keep you on track. Um, the course materials include ungraded quizzes for you to just sort of check your understanding of concepts, and then there are graded discussion forums and practical exercises. So there are also optional opportunities for enrichment. We do webinars, for example, with actual lawyers from Creative Commons, where you can just really ask them absolutely anything that's on your mind about licensing and copyright and OER sorts of things. We have a Slack workspace where you can network and engage with folks taking the course uh, from all over the world. The course is open to absolutely everyone. Courses run multiple times a year. Registration is pretty much always open at some point. Um, in fact, registration is open right now for our course running in June. <laughs> So on the next slide here, there's a little bit more information. Um, if you go to the registration site, which is um, put in the chat, you'll see we do offer a couple different specializations. So there's a certificate for librarians, which is focused primarily on issues facing academic librarians, um, but you know is applicable to, to multiple library types. There's a certificate for educators, which is designed for educators of any type. Those courses usually see the broadest audience, people working in classrooms from K-12, um, in higher ed. We have people from the Wikimedia Foundation taking that course, people in nonprofits and NGOs. And we have a, a newly developed certificate for GLAM workers. So these are folks specifically working in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, we recognize that they usually have some different concerns and some special considerations around OER. Um, the CC certificate course does cost money. So unfortunately, it's not 100% free. <laughs> Um, the money pays for expert facilitators who guide you through the course um, and give you really detailed and individualized feedback on all the assignments that you do. Um, and the assignments is really the heart of the course. We design them to be very um, hands-on and practical demonstrations of knowledge. So we usually encourage folks to you know, make an artifact that you can actually use in your work. So a lot of people make libguides or videos or even just, you know, write up a Word document with like ideas for a future libguide or video. Um, but all of the course materials are CC by licensed. So they're openly available. There's an audio version for people who want to listen in the car. Um, and there's several translations. Um, 
And I believe that link was also put in the chat on the resources page. And there's a ton more information at certificates.creativecommons.org. Um, I see some people in the chat have taken the course. Um, one of our uh, other facilitators is here. Hi, Paola. Um, so any questions, always happy to talk about the Creative Commons certificate courses. Um, but I also wanted to take a few minutes to talk about some other options, especially, um, you know, I'm aware that um, pandemic especially has has kind of made things a lot harder financially for a lot of institutions. And so it can be difficult to kind of uh, afford some of these professional development opportunities. Um, so on the next slide here, there is another course um, and this is a little bit of a shameless plug, I will say, because I also teach this course. Um, so there's a course through Library Juice Academy. Um, Library Juice Academy is a professional development organization that is geared primarily towards librarians. So everyone else bear with me for a minute while I talk to the librarians in the Zoom. Um, what I've done here is because the CC CERT course is uh, openly licensed, um, I've been able to adapt some of those materials and expand upon them um, in a shorter version focused specifically on librarian needs. So there's this four week course available through Library Juice Academy. It's also an asynchronous course, but with weekly deadlines. Uh, has similar material, but is um, less about the specific intricacies of the CC licenses because that already exists in the certificate in the Creative Commons certificate courses. And I do a lot more in depth discussions on exceptions and limitations to copyright, especially in the US and Canada, which is primarily where the audience um, for LJA is. So we talk a lot about fair use, we talk about the Teach Act, and we talk about some other open license things that go beyond Creative Commons. Um, registration for that course is also open now. It does cost money. Um, the course materials, uh, I'm actually still editing them at the moment in preparation for the first week of June when we run this course. Um, it just ran for the first time in January and I'm taking some of that feedback and running it again uh, in June but I'm hoping to publish those and make them openly licensed so that further people can adapt this content um, because copyright law is tricky, but there's no reason that we can't make this information and knowledge more available and open to anyone who's interested. Um, and on my next slide here, I have, uh, if for people who start dipping their toes into Creative Commons licenses, and are like, you know what, this copyright stuff seems really cool and I wanna get super into the nitty gritty details of copyright. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, but these are courses that I have taken in the past. And so I really recommend them because I think they were great. Um, these are both run through Coursera. So they are free, the content is completely free. It's mostly watching videos and doing readings with some quizzes. You can pay extra money for a certificate, but. I didn't, for example, the content is just out there. Um, and there's both of these courses are asynchronous. They're entirely self-paced. There's one on copyright for educators and librarians and one that specifically is about copyright for multimedia, which I found especially helpful as we transitioned more and more things online uh, due to COVID. And these courses were developed by super smart copyright folks. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with Kevin Smith. Um, he was integral in developing these courses when he was still at Duke. Uh, so these I also recommend. They're much shorter than the first two courses I talked about, but they have a really good foundation. And someone in the chat just mentioned Copyright X. And that's what I'm gonna talk about as I wrap up here. So on the next slide, uh, I've called this the one course to rule them all. This is arguably the most comprehensive and legally rigorous copyright course, especially the one that you can take for free. Uh, it's run by the Harvard Law School in partnership with Harvard X and the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Um, it's arguably the one that's closest to a real course if you want to sort of relive your college or grad school days. Um, it is synchronous, so there are weekly readings and videos. You read actual case law, so it is fairly time intensive. There are weekly synchronous lecture seminars where your attendance is required. And the only assessment is a comprehensive final exam um, that they, I think they estimate that it takes, I don't know, something like 15 or 30 hours to complete. It's intense. <laughs> 
very research heavy, where they give you several legal scenarios and you actually analyze them step by step using the legal tools that you've learned. Uh, when you take this course, when I took it, they ran an online section for librarians and it ran concurrently with the actual copyright class that Harvard Law students took on the Harvard campus during, I think it's a first year law class. So you're getting the same content that those law students are getting at Harvard. Um, the course is free. It's open to anyone. You don't have to be a librarian or a professor. You don't have to have a PhD. Um, you do have to apply to take the course and explain why you're interested in it. Their enrollment is limited. Admission is pretty selective. But on the website here um, that also was put in the chat, you can find the recent syllabi. And those uh, are openly available. And they have links to all the reading materials. And most of those reading materials are actually um, actual case law and judges opinions so that's all material of the federal government it's mostly in the public domain and that's a lot of fun to read through if you really want to see like oh well i know how fair use i you know, they told me i can use this thing in my oer because it's fair use but how did that happen or why is that so you usually can find the readings in the copyright X syllabi that actually show you, oh, here's the actual case in X year decided by X judge where it was decided that this is fair use in the US. You can actually see where a lot of that stuff comes from. Um, so that's all I have for now, uh, but I will be here at the end for Q&A. If anyone has any questions or wants to know anything else, um, definitely feel free to put questions in the chat. So thank you to Nathan, to Una, to Liz, um, you know, all the folks at CCOER and at Open Education Global uh, for putting this together today. Thank you, Shanna. This is great. A lot of uh, shout outs in the chat uh, for your um, facilitator skills. So that's great and lots of great information here. Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it to Cheryl Collier. Um, she's gonna talk uh, about um, additional um, networking and um, and learning about OER. And I think Cheryl's having a little difficulty with her bandwidth, so we might not see her video, which is fine. Um, Cheryl, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna keep my video off for now and, and pray that you can hear me. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. So I've been asked to talk about more advanced professional development opportunities. And so I've divided these into two buckets. Um, the first is building a community. And the second is um, kind of self-directed learning. So this first bucket is all about the importance of doing things together, because we can do so much more together than we can separately. Uh, I think developing partnerships and networks is critical when adopting and creating OER. The OER community is incredibly generous and supportive, and people are always willing to share help and advice and templates and encouragement. Um, so I'm going to go through these resources, OER Twitter, listservs and newsletters, learning communities, task forces or action committee committees and the Rebus community. Next slide, please. So I resisted Twitter for a long time, but Anita Walsh at Virginia Tech convinced me to get involved in OER Twitter, and she was right. It's a wonderful community and a great way to learn about new OER projects, research, and training opportunities. These are just a few of the groups and people I follow you'll quickly expand your network. And in the chat, I'm gonna drop a list that Nathan compiled of um, other Twitter recommendations. Okay, next slide. Like OER Twitter, listservs and newsletters are a good way to learn about professional development opportunities and to build your OER community. I subscribe to all of these. Uh, the digest option can be a good way to reduce the number of emails that you get. And while there's some duplication in postings, each one also has unique content. If you're adopting OER and looking to see what's available, the Spark Lib OER archives are a good place to check first. Spark stands for the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. There's a rich history of help with OER topics, often hard to find subjects. Um, there have been things like mortuary science and 
all, all kinds of topics that people have asked for help on. So those are archived uh, for you to search. Uh, Sparks monthly community call is library focused, but it's open to anybody. Recent topics have included leadership in open education, inclusive access, otherwise known as automatic textbook billing, OER outreach and events, and commercial use of Creative Commons licensed materials. There's an archive of notes for the Spark community calls, which you'll get access to when you sign up for Lib OER, but I don't believe the calls are recorded. Okay, next slide. So learning communities can be another great way to do professional development. In 2019-20, I co-led an OER community. And then in summer 2020, we did beginning and advanced Pressbooks communities to coincide with our campus launch, uh, a soft launch of the Pressbooks publishing system for OER. I partnered with a nutritional sciences instructor on the OER community and with the digital learning instructional technologists on the Pressbooks communities. We did these with zero budget. We used the resources of Faculty Affairs larger faculty learning community program to market ours. So this helped with communications and it also serviced people that we didn't realize were interested in OER. I've set up a Google Drive folder with our Pressbooks learning community resources. So feel free to adapt anything that you find there. We cover topics like copyright, fair use, CC licenses, open pedagogy, project management, collaborative annotation with the hypothesis tool, interactive H5P activities and accessibility. And the weekly folders in that uh, Google Drive folder include PowerPoint slides and agendas and follow-up emails that you can adapt, and they have links to lots of different resources. If your cap campus doesn't yet have learning communities, I recommend reaching out to campus partners to see about starting one. There are lots of different models for learning communities. Karen Pakula, who's the OER faculty development coordinator for Minnesota State, has previously shared about their learning circles where participants get a stipend. And she did some great sessions for the Open Education Network. And those recordings are available on its YouTube channel. And the links are in my slide notes. OK, next slide. So speaking of campus partners, it's really valuable to build networks of OER stakeholders. At the very least, you can see about organizing a listserv. I use ours to share the OER digest with campus. We formed an OER action committee a few years ago that includes all of these partners. Campus also has a new student success and retention innovation unit that I need to recruit. Other Potential partners could be cultural centers, um, your fundraising foundation, your inst institutional research office. Uh, if you do course marking, your registrar. I encourage you to be creative when thinking about who your partners could be. Um, the Rebus community is another great resource for, for professional development. And uh, it was co-founded by, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the That's Rebus community. No, that was me. <laughs> uh, this is another great resource for professional development. And it was co-founded by Pressbooks uh, founder, Hugh McGuire. It's a fabulous community for collaborating on OER projects and for getting help and support. If you're looking for co-authors on an OER project, this is the first place I recommend going. And the top slide on, or the top URL on this slide offers links to resources, like two of the great guides um, published by the Rebus community. There's a guide to making open textbooks with students, and the one shown here, the Rebus guide to publishing open textbooks so far. Uh, it also has links to the monthly office hours webinars with the Open Education Network, which cover all kinds of publishing issues. 
Uh, the next one is May 20th with the fabulous Abby Elder um, that Ursula referenced um, from Iowa State. And she's going to be talking about faculty authoring workshops. Uh, on the Reba site, you can also sign up for their newsletter and read through their archive. This second URL is a help and questions page where you can ask questions about OER creation, for example, LaTeX issues. Uh, it also shares resources on accessibility, printing, and lots of other topics. Okay, next slide. So I'm calling this second bucket uh, professional development resources self-directed learning. And when I graduated from library school in 2008, I'd never heard of OER or Creative Commons. I've built my knowledge through lots of webinars and trainings and conferences. Um, these are, there's lots and lots of them available. Um, this URL here, um, the Google Doc, is a list of conferences that CCC OER has compiled. Uh, with the community's emphasis on open and the idea that sharing is caring, many of these are free or low cost. Uh, I think there are three conferences happening just this week alone. The OER toolkit is something that I've put together and it features a variety of resources, including many of the ones I've talked about today, as well as um, things on accessibility, finding OER and evaluating OER. It's licensed CC BY, so feel free to customize it for your own institution. And next I'll talk about the Open Education Network's Pub 101 curriculum and open pedagogy resources if you're involving students in the creation of OER. So the Pub 101 curriculum is part of the Open Education Network's publishing cooperative, which OEN members can join. I went through the training a couple of years ago and it was fantastic. OEN members can contact Karen Lauritsen for more information about the cooperative. Karen tells me that the next synchronous cohort will probably start in spring 2022. But the Pub 101 curriculum in Canvas is open to anyone and is licensed CC BY. And the various units, um, which are kind of outlined here, have really useful resources and templates for OER creation, like an adaptable OER publishing agreement. I really recommend this resource for anybody who's working on OER creation or adaptations. Okay, next slide. Lastly, uh, this is a link to the University of Arizona's Pressbooks site, which features open pedagogy research resources at this URL. It includes ideas for open pedagogy assignments, as well as videos, resource guides, and tips on doing open peer review. Our Pressbook site also has lots of other self-directed learning resources. So I will pass it back to Nathan now. All right, excellent. So many good resources, Cheryl. That is just amazing. So one of the, I think, things that we've seen in this uh, webinar, and I, I'm going to try to capture some things in the chat here. Uh, let me um, just forgive me for a second while I try to rearrange something on my desktop so I can do that better. Um, at any rate, we one of the things that we do want to do is to share these resources with you. And so we have created a um, a Google spreadsheet that is um, that is the first page of which is uh, borrowed from the Arlo professional development matrix. So that is uh, just a, a list of lots of the resources you've heard about, some others that you haven't heard about today. Um, and then um, an attempt to kind of identify what the competencies and skills and the audience is for that resource. So, so that, um, that should uh, help. And thank you, Liz. Yeah, Arlo stands for Regional Leaders in Open Education, which was a project as part of uh, OE Global. Um, I think it was started last year, um, last academic year. So um, 
we want to also share, we have another sh um, sheet. So one sheet is the professional development uh, matrix. Another sheet is just a list of additional resources. So try, I want to try to capture some things that are in the chat and uh, try to load them up there as well. And then finally, to help with that networking piece, we've also included a copy of statewide, a statewide leaders directory um, that, um, uh, that I believe Rebel C Coming Saul um, uh, put together um, recently. And that, that's a really helpful way to just identify people that are in your region or state that you might be able to reach out to if you're starting up a project or looking for collaborators. So I actually have a question for you uh, in the chat before we turn to questions for our panel. And that is, do you have a state or local OER group that is an excellent resource that maybe hasn't been mentioned so far? Or are you looking for one? Maybe you're from a state or a region where um, you don't know of people. Um, throw it in the chat. Um, let's see if somebody, if, if we can uh, create some connections today. Thank you, Jessica. I see Northeast OER Summit uh, being in there. That's a great regional conference. Um, Yes, thank you, Una. Okay, so you know if you if you want to put that in the chat, um, please do. Um, and and um, also if you have questions for our moderator, I mean for our panel, please uh, throw that in the chat as well. Um, I've kind of been um, uh, following a couple of the conversations, and um, so I'd like to next just turn to kind of a discussion question period. We have, uh, you know, ample time actually for for some discussion and questions. So if you have questions for the panel, um, you know, you can you can you can ask it in the chat. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it live, uh, please please do that. Um, so just uh, yeah, go ahead and 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 if you want to indicate either with a raised hand or um, a uh, or just throw something in the chat and let me know that you have a question. I'll be happy to, to acknowledge you and you can un unmute yourself and ask the question. I do want to say one thing that um, a couple of things that came up as we were uh, as we were going through um, that uh, I, I wanted to know um, Ursula on the Texas Learn OER. Um, do you, have you had any feedback from folks who are using, say, the certificate as part of a performance evaluation process or some kind of uh, a review of professional development at their local institution? That's a good question. And I am not aware if, if there's anyone. Um, I know Judith Sebesta, uh, Dr. Sebesta, the executive director of Digitex is on the call and she might have, she might know. But as far as I know, there isn't one anybody using that. Judith, if you had a if you had something to add, that'd be great. I, I just think the the idea of bringing OER professional development and OER creation as part of a performance evaluation process is such an important thing for institutions to do. I'm just wondering if people, and so I'm glad you, you all have that certificate, which I think is great. So I was wondering if folks are using it, but. Nathan and Ursula, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. That's great, that's a great question, Nathan. You know, we don't currently have a way of tracking that. So like Ursula, I'm really not certain to be honest. I sure would like to know whether or not folks are actually using that, particularly in promotion and tenure processes or for hiring processes, but we really don't know at this point. We're gonna to try to figure out a way to track that better, as well as the adaptations that are out there of Texas Learn OER. Again, we don't have a really good, a good means to track it. It's mostly been anecdotal so far. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And then I saw Yoli Bergstrom Lynch had raised her hand. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself, it'd be great, thanks. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Yoli Bergstrom Lynch. I'm a research instruction and outreach librarian at Trinity College and I'm the person that's primarily responsible for um, expanding our OER program. Um, and I recognize Shanna, I did the Creative Commons certificate program for librarians with her and she's absolutely outstanding. So I cannot say enough about her as an instructor. But anyway, um, 
um, my question is, so at Trinity right now, we have uh, a mini grant program where we offer faculty $500 to review OER and an additional 1000 to incorporate OER into their courses. Um, and one of the things we're looking to do starting probably in the spring is building instead just instead of having just a mini grant program we're looking to develop um, a kind of OER faculty fellows program that's a community of practice where we have uh, workshops that we offer faculty and then they can get together and 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 discuss OER and um, I'm just wondering if there are any resources out there about how to build a OER faculty fellows program or community of practice. I think that might be a question for Cheryl. Cheryl, you did mention a, some, maybe you had some resources that can help people build a faculty fellows or community learning community on campus. Yeah, so I think our, our learning community could function as a, a faculty fellows program. We broadened it beyond faculty to include instructional designers and program managers and other folks. But take a look in that Google Drive folder and I'll put the link in the chat Again, uh, uh, there are yeah, all kinds of resources that you can adapt there. Uh, I know that Amy Hoffer in Open Oregon has also um, created materials for faculty development. So let me see if I can find the link to, um, to her resources and I'll put those in the chat as well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Cheryl. And I noticed Cheryl also asked a question in the chat, and I just want to make sure to bring it up. And she was asking all of you attendees, um, are there any topics for professional development that you're seeking, some specific topics that maybe you have needs for on your campus? Go ahead and throw them in here, and, and maybe we can connect you, connect you to a resource. I had a question for Shanna. I was wondering, um, you know, this is like a really basic question, but maybe. I don't know, maybe it will be helpful. The idea is, the question is, like, why do people need to know so much about copyright? Like, I mean, people in open education, why do they, and, and who, who's coming to these classes? Like, who, who do you find uh, gets, you know, gets stuff out of it? I know you talked about the different kinds of certificates directed at different groups, but, but maybe you could give us a little bit more insight into like, why, why, we, should, why we should go further to understand that stuff. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, so this sort of stuff is relevant to pretty much anybody who works in education. Um, and I've been in education for a long time at all levels. Um, I started off in high schools and middle schools, and then I was a public librarian teaching mostly adults in the community. Now I'm back in higher ed. Um, and, but there's this, uh, you know, as most of you folks here know, because you're in the OER community and you're sort of steeped in this sharing culture, but education in general has a lot of this sharing culture where you'll make an artifact and share it with the other teachers at your institution. And now that we have the internet, um, you're able to share it with teachers beyond your institution and in all sorts of places. And this has raised a lot of questions about, well, if somebody just sends me a thing in my email, what am I allowed to do with it? You know, I want to make sure that I'm being uh, respectful, not only of the, the laws of whatever jurisdiction I live in, you know, nobody wants to get sued for copyright infringement. That's no fun. But um, one of the really nice things about the CC licenses is that they're sort of opt in, right? Like not only does the license tell you what you're legally allowed to do, um, but it tells you ethically what the creator had in mind when they shared the thing. So, you know, when you learn about the different licenses, you learn about the different parts, you know, sometimes there are some licenses that say you can use my thing, but not for commercial purposes. So now you know, okay, the creator who made this thing wants it to be used out there in the world, but they don't want me to make money off of it because it's their property and that's okay, I can respect that. And now I know exactly that that's what I need to do. Um, some will say you can use my thing, but you can't adapt it. You have to use it as is. I don't want other people to change my work. You know, I'm very dedicated to it. Now you know, okay, great. This is the covenant that I enter into as a member of a sharing society. Um, so I think it can be really helpful um, you know, even if you're not a person who wants to get super into the weeds of 
all the legal language and things, you know, you're out there looking online for lesson plans or for teaching guides or for textbooks and other resources you can use in your class and you just start to see all these logos and all these symbols and you don't know what they mean and you google them and you're like okay well this one says cc by and this one says cc by nc and this one says cc by sa and what what is that can i use it or not that's all i want to know <laughs> and so a lot of these courses are really helpful um and sort of being able to to define that space a little more clearly and to kind of spell out okay yes you can you know here here is the situation in which you can and can't use the thing um and i see some good comments in the chat too yeah that's great i i think and i think judith's comment in the chat about mm -hmm. you know how in fact i mean i guess in principle you know i think we can agree that that education really should be a sharing practice and yet in fact it seems that um so much of uh, academia is is really about not sharing um and so i think it's uh you know maybe that's uh maybe this learning about these sorts of things can also uh help us shift the culture of education that would be really cool yeah and i think some of that um is a is a need for a culture shift and some of it too and, and we go over this like in week one of the cc course for example some of this is due to the law sort of lagging behind the technology um as it tends to do so we have the internet now it makes it a lot easier for me to share textbooks but even to share like video files and of course the teach act is like super antiquated and makes it really hard to teach online with video um and like why why is that <laughs> we can do better um so some of this is just like open licenses i think you know when cc developed these 20 years ago or so a lot of it too had to do with sort of bridging that gap between what the technology allows and what the laws that are rooted in 17th century printing practices allow yeah and then when they get written they they get rewritten in ways that are not favorable to individuals but favorable to uh, large corporations it seems yeah uh, just to editorialize for a minute um so yeah i think um these are great um cheryl i wanted to ask you um what your experience of kind of the level of engagement that you're seeing on your campus um, in terms of like what what you were talking about sort of building communities um, around you know in OER engaging in self-directed learning do you see that kind of catching on at your campus and what do you think are the catalysts to get people around you kind of engaged in that type of process yeah that's a great question uh, and one of the frustrations that I've had um, doing course material initiatives is, is really lack of bandwidth. There's so much more we could do if we didn't have our press books as kind of a self-directed program. Um, so we've really had to find targeted ways to support faculty. Um, and this learning community was really a, a nice way to um, allow faculty to meet each other. And I ended up meeting a professor in the iSchool who has for the past two semesters done an open pedagogy project with her class in Pressbooks. Actually, just right before this, uh, this webinar, she sent me the link to the finished version. Um, so I will share that in the chat. It's, it's a really cool, uh, humans are social media textbook that has all kinds of student perspectives on social media. Um, I don't know if I ever would have connected with this professor if it hadn't been for setting up this learning community. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I try to be involved in various campus groups like faculty governance and our student affairs policy committee and instructional design groups, um, campus technology groups, just to meet various people from across campus um, to build those networks. Um, yeah, there, there are lots of different ways to do it, but scalability is always the challenge. That's great. Great to hear um, your experiences there. I wanted to um, shout out that Laura Cummins in the chat was asking about um, doing some open pedagogy 
I would say broadly open pedagogy types of assignments in her Spanish language class. Um, and then Jessica, I think is replying to that and provided a great resource for open pedagogy called the Open Pedagogy Notebook, um, which has, uh, is basically a crowdsourced um, sort of collection of different uh, strategies, uh, learn lesson plans, practices for engaging students. You might find something there, um, Laura, and, um, or if anybody else has something specific to Spanish language, I think uh, that's a really interesting thing. Um, the one thing I would say as someone who tries to do a little bit of open pedagogy in, in my class is, is that the, the big thing is, the big thing, the biggest thing for me is to try to think of an assignment that gets the students to think about creating something that is for their peers or for the public, rather than creating something that's simply for me to review their work. And I think that's the big shift. Um, and then once you make that shift, um, I think uh, sort of developing, coming up with ideas is, is a little easier. Oh, great, Paola um, responds that, um, yeah, she's gonna, she's gonna look into uh, so, some Spanish li librarians in the European network and, and then get back to us, so that's great. And again, um, just to, to note, you know, that CCCOER has a very active listserv and you can, uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that you, we frequently see sharing and questions uh, about in the listserv. And so, you know, if, we, if you post back information about that in the listserv, that would also be really helpful. Great, lots of resources coming in. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, Nathan, but before we go, I just wanted to put in a plug for the SPARC Open Education Leadership Program. That's another professional development. Um, it's, I am just completing mine. Uh, I've been in it. It's a year long program. There's a open call applications are due by the end of the month for the next cohort. Uh, and it previously had been only librarians, but last year they opened it up to non librarians. And uh, it is a great, I, I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot about um, open education and we've had some really great discussions about what it means to be open and especially related to equity. So I, I would just like to encourage anybody who's interested in that to check it out. That's outstanding, thanks. And thanks for sharing the link. Uh, I think we doubled up on each other there, but that's all right. And someone mentioned, um, I think Paolo mentioned earlier that she would just love to have a, um, a copy of the chat. And so someone else mentioned that you are able to download a copy of the chat just by going to the bottom of the chat there and there are three dots. If you click on that and say uh, save chat, you should be able to save a version of the chat as a text file to your machine. Uh, I hope that's not just something that's available to me as a co-host, um, and I'm, but uh, hopefully that is available to everyone. Hi hey, everyone, it's Paula here. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, that's great. Thank you, Nat. Thank you, Nathan. It's just that uh, if you if you didn't have the chance to enter uh, to the chat since the beginning, or if you lost the connection for any kind of reason, which happened to me. You can't have the whole chat. That's why I was asking, okay? <laughs> great point, great point. Thank and you I very think much. That's, that could be something we can do. Um, I'll definitely save a copy and we can, uh, I'm, I don't think it would be a problem to share it uh, to, the, um, to archive it with the slides and the, the recording and everything. Seems Thank like you. Una's saying that, that she can, we can do that. So do we have one last question? Um, about six minutes left. Or any co final comments or thoughts from our panelists? Okay, well, um, 
I just want to thank so much. I want to thank my, our panelists. You all were really incredible. Um, so much energy and resources that are being shared here. Hopefully this will uh, inspire you all um, who have attended and, and um, provide you with the kinds of things you need to take the next step. Also want to say, uh, apologize to Shanna and Cheryl for butchering your last names. Um, I shouldn't do that. That's bad moderator practices. So uh, I apologize. So I want to end just by um, letting you know about events that are upcoming um, with CCC OER. So we are finishing out our spring webinar series. Um, this is uh, our May 12th um, webinar. We have the last one on June 9th is about making classrooms equitable and anti-racist. So obviously a very important and timely topic. Um, so I hope you can join us for June 9th. Um, and please, as I've mentioned, stay in the loop, keep uh, the community going. Um, definitely come to go to the website, see, get involved and learn more. If you go into the learn more tab, that's where you find uh, recordings and information about our webinars. Get Join our community email listserv, um, and then we've been running a, um, a uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion series of blog posts. So I encourage you to read those uh, student impact stories uh, about how OER is uh, expanding access and, and, um, and reaching out to the students that um, need it most. Um, if you have any further questions, please reach out to our um, Director Una Daly, uh, her assistant Liziata, our, our, our presidents, Lisa Young or Sue Tashin. Um, I think that is it. Um, so thank you all so much for, for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>